Wow, thank you, Michael. That was um, wonderful to hear. Thank you all for coming out. Um, so I'm going to read for about 15 minutes a little bit from the introduction and then a super brief pa passage from one of the first chapters. Um, so just a little bit about the book. Unprocessed is the narrative of a year in which I decided to not eat processed food. And so the book is sort of what is processed food? What makes each individual food, wheat, grain, sugar, dairy, processed? in our industrial food system, and how can any individual eater, given limited time and income, reclaim some of that? So that's some of the context. Um, and I'm just going to dive right in. And then after I read, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Can everyone hear me good? Well? <laughs> OK, great. Wait, Tyler says, isn't peanut butter processed? The peanut butter jar is in my left hand, spoon in my right. A banana, unpeeled, waits on the counter. I stick the spoon back in the jar and turn to face Tyler, my sister's husband, sitting at the kitchen table of my parents' house outside Los Angeles. No, I say, it's just ground up peanuts. Well, isn't that a kind of processing? Well, yes, I mean, all foods are processed, at least to some degree. So then what's the difference between ground up peanuts and, say, partially hydrogenated peanut oil? I sigh. I thought my sister had already explained the logic of my upcoming year to her husband, but evidently Tyler is feeling contrary this January morning so soon after the holidays. It's pestering like this that makes him feel more like a brother than a sister's husband, but I am nervous on the cusp of a year on process and I don't want to argue semantics. There are degrees of processing, I say, placing the peanut butter jar back on the counter. I'm trying to find the line of what makes a food too processed. With the exception of, say, a raw foraged mushroom, risky business, all food has undergone some processing before landing on our plates. By way of harvest or heat, all food is processed, and often it is better for it. But increasingly, it is not. Today, the word process refers to adulterated foods, foods that have been shifted and shaped into packages that are not better, not for us or for the earth. All foods are processed, but if we understand the difference between an apple and a bag of cheddar Chex Mix, and we do, and if the space between the two matters for the health of our bodies and the environment, and it does, then the question of what makes a food too processed also matters. I decided to see if I could go a year without eating a processed food, or rather a food I de deemed too processed. When I first hatched the project, around the time that Tyler was bugging me in my parents' kitchen, I thought that I should figure out precisely what made a food processed and then begin. But as it turned out, it would take me a year to figure out where to draw the line, to understand where our food system su succeeds and fails in processing food from land. That figuring out is this book. In the spring of my senior year of college at the University of Denver, I saw Al Gore give the famous PowerPoint presentation that inspired the documentary An Inconvenient Truth. I had seen the film the previous Christmas with, with, previous Christmas with my sister and mom. Those two hours sitting in a dark theater horrified us. The world was beautiful, it was whole, and we were breaking it apart. And then the credits rolled. The theater lights lifted and we walked knob-kneed out of the theater. Our fear dissipated into dinner plans. The evening I went to see Al Gore in the flesh, I was on the precipice of all those decisions that come with college graduation. Riding the light rail downtown, I read a few pages in Ernesto Guevara's Guerrilla War Warfare. I was taking a senior seminar about che, che, and although I wasn't into the icon's militarism and ego, I was enthralled by his boldness how he'd stuck his thumb into the spinning status quo and changed how one small part of the world worked. I was enthralled, but in my life, being this bold, Che bold, felt incompatible with an infrastructure already in place, one that included careerbuilder.com and an apartment lease. As comm commencement approached, we graduates were told again and again, be bold. But I didn't really know how. I wondered, can boldness exist only in military fatigues? Could it also wear a sundress and flip-flops? Al Gore was, as I expected him to be, amiable and twangy. But unlike the movie experience, I was actively in my mind and body as I listened, fidgety and lacking the distance offered by film. The lights in the convention center never dimmed, and so they didn't rise. I carry carried my terror with me all the way home. It was all happening now, chemicals in the air, sweating world. It was now, 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 9 p.m. on a Tuesday. I called my dad, a quantum physics professor, arbitrator of big decisions. Right, he said, it's scary stuff. But what do we do? I asked. What do I do? I should just change my major from English to astrophysics or environmental science. I could just stay in college for another year. I would learn the tools needed to fix this problem. Global warming was my generation's problem. This would be my life's big gesture. But Megan, he said, do you like science? I don't know. I could. 
Big gestures are important, he said, but big stuff starts at the day to day. You've got to like what you're doing on a Wednesday afternoon in order to solve the big problems. Rather than figure out what should fill my Wednesday afternoons, I approached a professor and asked him for contacts in Latin America. I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to see the world and to speak Spanish. My professor emailed a friend who owned a hotel in Nicaragua and needed a volunteer English teacher. So I finished my English degree and moved to Playa Gigante, a small fishing village of 500 people, to work at the hotel and start a free English language program for the town's residents. I arrived in Playa Gigante expecting, well, I don't know what I was expecting, fewer scorpions, more infrastructure, less mud, more electricity. I lived in a bunk bed in the staff quarters, shared a bathroom with four surfers, and I lived out of my backpack. Only after I arrived did I learn how closely Nicaragua had been tied to Che and Castro. How, inspired by the Cuban Revolution in 1979, a scrappy crew of guerrilla soldiers and untrained civilians overthrew a government backed by the biggest superpower in the world. But my day-to-day -day life was simple, elemental. When I wasn't teaching my English class every morning, afternoon, and evening, I was reading, running on the beach, or drinking beer with Juan, the hotel's manager. Save for the quantity of beer I consumed, another, I made very few choices. I ate what was given to me, scrambled eggs and gallo pinto, rice and beans for breakfast, fried fish or fried chicken and gallo pinto for dinner. Playa Gigante had no grocery stores or markets, so if I wanted any food that wasn't stocked in the hotel's kitchen, I had to ask Juan to buy it for me when he drove the hour into Rivas, the closest city, to do our weekly shopping. I'd lived in Playa Gigante for six months before I discovered that the town had a convenience store in the form of a name, man named Castro, who sold dried good eggs and soda out of a back room of his house. When it rained, the electricity went out and my younger students didn't come to class. Rain or no rain, I went running in the afternoon, so I'd see them sitting on plastic chairs below corrugated zinc roofs or stirring gallo pinto over wood-burning stoves. I'd wave at my adult students, fishermen, as they strung out their nets, tying knots and repairing lines. I ran around cows that stood like boulders, staring unblinkingly at the long-legged gringa. I darted around strutting wild turkeys and passed pigs burrowed into the cool mud. My life was stark and I settled into its starkness. I settled in so much that I stayed in Nicaragua for a year instead of the three months I'd planned. And when I finally did come home, I was shocked. Culture shocked, abundance shocked, choice shocked. My first day back in Los Angeles, I went to a supermarket and wandered up and down the aisles, overwhelmed. Gloriously overwhelmed, it's true. There was peanut butter, so many kinds, and granola, so many flavors, and fresh vegetables, so many available at the same time. But I've, as I marveled at the abundance, I also marveled that I ever assumed abundance was the only option that I'd ever believed there would always be food and that it would always be plentiful. For the first time in my life, I wondered, why does anyone need the choice of nine kinds of peanut butter? Of course, peanut butter seems to have nothing to do with global warming, with communism or capitalism, but the more I learned, the more I realized that everything is connected. Consumption in the wealthy north and poverty in the developing south. A changing climate and a food system that exhales almost half of all greenhouse gases emitted in the United States political unrest in Latin America, and the policies we pursued at home. The threads I tugged began to lead back to the same knot. And one way into the tangle of that knot was food. Food, at least, at least the way we now grow, process, and transport it, has changed the climate. Ironically, now the changing climate will dictate how we can grow foods in the future. Food leaves countries like Mexico, Peru, and Chile, and enters markets in the United States, usually to the economic benefit of us eaters instead of faraway producers. Food overwhelms us with cheap choice, and so we, in turn, overwhelm our bodies with too much of it. I grew up a complacent eater and citizen, aware of issues, but believing that my civic responsibility was to educate myself, to study hard and get a good job, patience little girl, so that I could join the power brokers and finally turn my frustration with our broken food system into a contribution, into some sort of solution. Some challenges, like global warming, feel so insurmountable that it seems as though nothing can be done but we live in a world full of insurmountable obstacles. And we do things. Without small specificity, without localness and precision of place, it is hard to ask and harder to answer, what do we want to change and how do we want to do it? It's a sweltering Wednesday night in June, midway through my year in process, when I begin to figure out the answer to this question. I ride my bike to the Loft Cinema in Tucson to meet second date Mark and arrive wearing Tucson's summer sash the right-to-left line of soaked fabric that forms under my messenger bag like the Indiana ribbon of a Miss America contestant. We're here for the Tucson premiere of Heist, Who Stole the American Dream, a documentary about the 2008 financial collapse and corruption on Wall Street and in Washington. 
When Francis Causey, the film's director, and Kimber Lanning, the director of Local First Arizona, take the stage for a Q&A, an audience member asks the inevitable question. So what can I do? What can any of us do huddled by our air conditioning units on this desert island so far away from the traffic circles of Washington, D.C.? Kimber ran a record store in Phoenix before she started Local First Arizona, a nonprofit organization that works to strengthen local economies in the state. Shaggy black hair hangs around her face, a brown dress wrapped close to her curves, shiny heels tilt toward the audience and then lean back. She speaks without saying um, without shifting her weight around her chair. Frances fidgets, rubbing the cord of the microphone up and down, but Kimber sits, composed and certain. Her answer is simple, spend money better. The American consuming public is the elephant in the room, she says. We forget that our individual buying power is the most power we have, any one of us, and we give it away without thinking. Our dollars have the power to change the way things run, and yet we give them away with such ease. Money circulates, money travels, and money rushing through Wall Street does not simply appear out of the ether. I buy things and my dollars trickle toward the center. We treat mother money as an either or. Either we have money or we do not have money. But we often don't stop to consider what happens in between, how money flows through a community. Kimber tells us this. If a community the size of Tucson shifted 10% of its spending to local businesses, a 10% shift, not an increase, within one year we would create almost $140 million in new revenue for the city. What that also means, I realize, is that we would withhold that $140 million from the balance sheets of those corporations that then use our money to influence government policy, to grow unsustainable food, to waste energy, to process and sell us foods that aren't good for us. I want to grab my date, this man I barely know, and tell him, I figured it out. Now I understand. But I hardly know him, and so I quit, sit quietly and buzz with this idea, this wonderful articulation of what I had felt about changing the way I bought food but couldn't quite say. My dollars reverberate, of course. The dollars I spend at Safeway or at a CSA. These dollars matter. So what if I spent my dollars in a different way? Distribute my small portion not to the center, to the bargain shops and industrial producers, but to the periphery to the locally accountable corners of my country rather than the abstract black hole of its center. I ride my bike home chewing on this idea. It is precisely because I have so few dollars that I should treat them so preciously, should make sure that each and every one vibrating out there in the world is behaving itself. I love this idea because it is quiet, immediate, and personal. So then that's part of the introduction, and then I dive into wheat. That's the first thing I try to tackle and try to unprocess. So I'm just going to read the beginning part of that. On my first morning of unprocessed, on the inaugural Sunday of a year of Sundays, I bake bread. My first loaf of bread begins with a bag of Trader Joe's 100% whole wheat flour. I believe that whole grain flour, as opposed to refined white flour, is unprocessed because I believe I could mash up a bunch of wheat berries in my kitchen and make something griddly like flour. This is yet a theoretical belief on the 15th day of January. Today, on this first day of unprocessed eating, all I have is a crumpled paper sack holding two pounds of whole wheat flour and a hazy belief in its integrity. I have never baked whole wheat bread before. I've never baked any kind of bread that required kneading rather than stirring together sweet batter. While I am in my apartment ba baking bread, my friend Hillary is in hers, overseeing chicken in a pot that will become chicken in a soup. Sarah is assembling ingredients to toss together in a salad. Later tonight, we will converge for the first unprocessed potluck. The philosophy that guides my cooking and my kitchen is this. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. In cooking, as in life, even as we strive for flawlessness, most often what we achieve is good enough. If one's oven knob is, oven's knob is so old it no longer displays temperature settings, 250-ish is good enough. If one does not own a 1 8 teaspoon measuring device, a, pin, a pinch will do. This philosophy generally serves me well as I cook with confidence rather than compliance. My sautés and scrambles generally benefit from the sense of adventure and I have a fair enough understanding of ratios that my baked goods rarely suffer from inexactitude. So when I try my hand at whole wheat bread, I approach the task with the same sort of shoulder shrug. We eat water, yeast, honey, and oil. How hard could it be? According to my recipe, I should dissolve yeast in one quarter cup of warm water, 110 degrees, and allow it to proof for three to five minutes. I don't pause to consider the relative hotness of 110 degree water. 110 degrees sounds hot to me, so I release a steam stream of tap water into a stove pot and set it to boil, reasoning that I'll let it cool down to 110 degrees post-boiling while I work on the other components of my bread. I measure out six cups of whole wheat flour, a teaspoon of seed salt, sea salt, a third a cup of honey, and a fourth a cup of olive oil. 
The final ingredient, apart from the proof yeast, is the water. So I return to my steaming pot on the stove. I dunk my finger in, and indeed, it is hot. I measure out two cups for my flour mixture and a fourth a cup to whisk with my yeast. The yeast plunks into the water. One tablespoon, two, they plop into the water and then promptly sink in two fists of beige, decidedly not forming, as the recipe says they should, a creamy foam on the surface. The yeast huddles on the bottom of the glass, hugs the sides, sticks together as I attempt to whisk it about. I persevere. Yeast water meets flour on oil honey. I knead, I wait, I knead again. After six hours, the dough seems like it has risen a little. It has certainly not doubled, as the recipe suggests that it will, but it seems a little lifted, a bit cheerier. The supper hour fast approaches, so I mold the dough on a pan to take to Hillary's. Maybe something magical will happen in the heat of the oven. Maybe the oven will transform the sad log of dough into something more. We'll bestow upon its heaviness five loaves and two fishes. I hold the loaf pan aloft as I descend the narrow cement stairs into Hillary's basement floor apartment. Sarah is already there. Megan, she cries, opening the door with wide eyes and cheerful yellow pants. I give her short frame a tight hug as I duck into the warm apartment. It smells like soup, a cozy compliment to the flickering candles and stacked bookshelves. After a night in Safeway and a day in my kitchen, I am thrilled to be among friends instead of food. As Hillary emerges from her tiny kitchen, I pull back my dish towel to reveal my day's project. Damn, it shrunk on the way over, I say when I see that the small accumulation of cheer has wilted into concavity. Cowardly bread, why won't you rise? It looks lovely, Sarah says. Hillary nods in agreement. Are you nervous? Ready? Sarah asks. Yeah, to both. I think it'll be good to just start. Well, I'm excited, Hillary says. To help me ease into new habits, or perhaps ease herself out of her bad ones, Hillary has decided to join me in unprocessed eating for the first two weeks of my year. Though she had decided friendly relations with her on-again, off-again boyfriend required that pizza still be allowed, her unexpected enthusiasm allows my new and nervous commitment to begin among company rather than in confinement. If I'd feared that a year in process would confine me to my kitchen, that by unraveling my food source, I would similarly unravel my social life, then this meal with Hillary and Sarah proves that even if the food changes, the dinner can be the same. I brought wine, Sarah says, and then pauses, horror struck. Wait, is wine unprocessed? Hillary stops her stirring and looks at me with a gaze that says plainly, it sure better be. Yeah, really, I say, agreeing with Hillary's look. I'm going to try to make it at some point this year, but until then, I'm operating under the assumption that I could theoretically ferment a bunch of grapes at home. Sarah and Hillary shoot each other a glance, relieved. After 15 minutes in Hillary's oven, the spread of dough doesn't budge. It emerges bread-like, something less like a loaf and more like biscotti, more like a cutting board, like a wheat frisbee. But it's warm and it tastes like wheat. It's Minute Maid bread, cooked from concentrate. I like dense bread, Hillary insists. Both Sarah and Hillary are low-maintenance di low dinner companions, and so we eat it. We break bread, slather it with honey, and the year of unprocessed begins. Um, would love to chat, answer questions. When was your year? When, when did this occur? And were you writing? I imagine you were writing as you were going, or journaling, or something. And but how did you compile the contents of the book in relation to that year? Yeah, I was in 2012 um, when I was a graduate student at the University of Arizona, and I did a lot of writing during the year. Um, partly because I was taking notes and recording personal experiences and also because I ended up doing a lot of reporting because um, in this chapter that I just read from, I needed to figure out how it is that we process grain. How have we historically? How do we do that now? And so I went out and interviewed you know, wheat farmers and uh, bread bakers and millers. And so I ended up doing a lot of reporting and that kind of catalyzed a lot of the writing. Mm -hmm. And did you find uh, certain brands or certain manufacturers that you would elevate to the unprocessed level as opposed to other ones, you know, like gold metal, flour, or whatever, you know? Yeah, um, definitely. So and as- Do you have those in your book? You have I have some of them, them, yeah, and more on my website. Um, so each chapter ends, so the chapters are structured by food, so like I said, wheat, dairy, sugar, and so each chapter ends with like an unprocess yourself section of ideas of what you can do. Um, like in this chapter, I end up hand, hand uh, milling my own wheat, Okay, well, if you don't want to do that, here are some food companies that sell what seem to be unprocessed flour. Um, so yeah, they're definitely in there, and kind of what to look for on labels, um, like keywords. So for grains, like you want sprouted grains, 
typically fermented grains are much easier to digest. So that kind of stuff is definitely in there. So you're kind of also developing your own criteria throughout the book as to what qualifies as unprocessed. Yeah, absolutely. So the, I guess I should have said this at the beginning, but the, um, the sort of like theoretical framework that I started my year with was if I could theoretically make a food at home, it was unprocessed. So for grain, I could theoretically make, like I said, whole grain at home. I couldn't refine flour. I knew that I couldn't, didn't have bleach. I didn't have an industrial sifter. So I didn't have any of the, the mechanics. Same with sugar. You know, I did, couldn't have a refined sugar at home. Um, and so that was sort of like the framework. And so if I you know, at the beginning of the year, I, I would buy, like, still buy plain yogurt at the store, because I did and often made yogurt at home, but plain yogurt with no additives seemed unprocessed to me. So, but as I considered each food, so dairy, meat, I definitely honed in on what made that particular food unprocessed, and each chapter starts with a sort of hypothesis of, like, so the grain chapter, the hypothesis is grain is unprocessed if it's whole, um, and, and it's different for every chapter. Like, what makes this particular food unprocessed? And it changed totally throughout my year. Yeah. Should we eat processed food now? Um, occasionally. I'm still like, I say I eat about 90% unprocessed. And that 10% is, you know, out with friends. That was a really hard part of my year of like, all of my friends are eating pizza and I'm not going to do that. And it's not about the pizza, it's about the like shared communal experience of, of eating food, whatever that food happens to be with people that you care about. So now I kind of reserve it for like brunch on a Sunday with a friend or like a chocolate bar because those are really convenient and nice to buy or a chocolate chip cookie, for example, because I love chocolate chip cookies. So they're very like, I'm very particular and it's very spotty when I will consume those, but I still cook at home mostly and you know, it made me feel better. So why would I stop doing that? How does the post year Megan compare to the pre year Megan physically? emotionally, psychologically? Yeah, physically pretty much the same. I'd say I didn't gain weight, I didn't lose weight, um, but like emotionally and psychologically much healthier relationship with food. Um, you know, I like learned how to listen to my body's cues of eating when I was hungry, stopping eating when I was full. I ate a lot of really delicious food and I didn't gain weight, whereas before I had sort of been dieting, had been really worried about that number on the scale, and then I just stopped weighing myself and kind of just sort of equilibrated and like, what does my body feel like? Um, and I think learned how to take a lot more joy in food. Um, you know, so many, so much of our culture is like food is guilt, food is like restriction. You know, what can't you eat this week? There's so much of that that narrative, and I think it's hard not to internalize that. And I think what this year kind of forced me to do was be like, okay, for example, I can't go have pizza with my friends, but if I go over to a friend's house and she's made unprocessed cornbread, like I am thrilled by that. So it like. The simple pleasure of sort of, of, of food really became, uh, you know, very clear to me. Yeah, all the way in the back. Well, I was wondering, um, in the process of the interviews for your, for your book, for your work at Edible Bob, what are a couple of the exciting farming projects you're seeing or projects that are getting unprocessed food? Um, yeah, I have a couple answers to that. Like, kind of in the vein of the book and what I, the section I read in terms of consumer spending, um, I've seen even since I stopped eating processed food, which was now like more than three years ago, um, it's much more in the public consciousness. There was an article in Fortune magazine maybe a month ago about how large food corporations are struggling to make profits on processed food. And that to me, I'm like, yeah, it's working. Like, Consumer spending means that if we vote with our dollars that we don't want processed foods, that we want to support producers in our community, then like food, large food corporations will not make those foods anymore. And so that I find to be really hopeful of like that, um, the sort of, that narrative is changing. Um, on a more local level, you know, in my, I think, I think there are so many amazing producers out there, you know, in every region of the country who are really passionate um, growing really delicious food or making really great cheeses, a kind of like that, like I think that there are more and more people kind of making really good, simple foods with heritage grains or, you know, any of the things that have come back. And I think that, so I'm super excited about that. And I think kind of we're getting to this critical mass of like figuring out better ways to connect producers with consumers because it's still 
often constrained to the farmer's market and that a lot of the research I've been doing with the magazine lately is that's not actually very convenient for consumers or profitable for producers. And so what are ways that we can streamline that? Maybe have, have co-ops in our community carry more food, maybe develop things like food hubs where they do distribution and aggregation of local foods to restaurants, to markets. So I think that space is super exciting right now. And when did it occur to you about the local food shift economy? Is that something ongoing, or did you suddenly want, oh, duh, if I don't buy processed foods and I buy it at the farmer's market or make it from simple things and I shop around the periphery of the supermarket instead of the center aisles, I'm, I'm actually helping my community and shifting that, that economy to do that. Yeah, like that moment I read was very true to that moment I realized it. Um, and it was, I was already halfway through my process year, and I, had, I really got into processed food for environmental reasons. So I was really interested in the environmental impact of food and how could I as an eater eat more sustainably. You know, so it was like environmental and health were my two ways that I kind of got into food. And then it really was that, that lecture I saw by this woman, and then I started researching Local First Arizona, and there are lots of studies out there like the one I... I quoted about multiplier effects and how the money we spend reverberates in our communities. And, that, and so it was like in the process of writing this book that I figured out the economic um, consequence of our food dollars. And that has actually become a really, maybe the most powerful motivator for me because that, that enables small producers to have better environmental impacts if they're making money rather than these large corporations who are maybe doing things that aren't very environmentally responsible. Well, and along with that, did you find that you were spending less on food because you were making it yourself uh, as opposed to, you know, I mean, people use that excuse of, I can't afford fresh food, I'm going to buy Twinkies uh, because they're cheap. Uh, how, how did you find your, your own budgeting going in that? Yeah, um, I mean, I think there is that narrative of local organic foods are more expensive and I, I don't, or not, or not, or fresh foods and not accessible if you're on a budget. And I don't, I don't think that's true. I think that we kind of have to change our perception of like what constitutes a meal. If you think it's a big hunk of meat and, you know, uh, lot, you know, fresh vegetables that maybe you need to think about polenta or, or grains, you know, you kind of have to change how you approach meals. And for me, it was like using ingredients that themselves might cost more, but making meals that were really simple. Um, but I spent more on food during my year. Um, I could afford it because I was making it a priority, but I think that's also something that we have to increasingly reckon with is that as consumers, we're not making food a priority. You know, we spend in the United States less of our disposable income on food than any other country in the world. We spend like 7% on food, and most other developed countries spend more like 25%. So during my year, I spent about 20 or 25% of my disposable income on food. And that, that might be high for a lot of people, but that's to me, is it, like the, it's a priority of mine, and so I'm absolutely fine with it. Yeah, and it's in the book. I talk about exactly how much I spent on food. I kept all the receipts for all the groceries I bought for over a year. And you can read them itemized. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Yeah, I don't think that's a millennial question, but maybe it is because of who's talking. Um, I mean, the first thing to do is just read the ingredient label on every food that you buy at the supermarket. So once you start realizing what are in the process and packaged foods, even if they seem like whole foods like tortillas or cereals or yogurt, mustard, all of those often have a lot of chemicals and stabilizers. All of those often have sugar. Um, refined sugar is in everything. And once you start reading ingredient labels, you'll kind of understand how the per capita consumption of sugar has gone like that. Um, so, you know, I didn't buy foods with any additives that I didn't know what they were. Um, so that's, I think, a really simple way. And then engaging with your local community. So I think joining a CSA program is a really great bang for your buck in terms of getting local organic produce. And it, like, it forces you to cook. <laughs> and cooking is the cheapest way to eat healthfully. Of course.
Yeah, I mean, I think that that's very chicken and the egg. It's like, and I think about that a lot in the book in terms of like, especially being a woman, thinking about these questions of like, uh, I'm really grateful for the legacy of processed foods that have enabled me to have a job and not spend my whole day cooking. So I think there's definitely a give and take in terms of work and home work. Um, but I think it's sort of thinking about priorities and what and um, how can you fit that into your life. And like, for me, it was a little bit like, um, and I think about this because I'm a writer and um, writers don't make lots of money, typically, <laughs> except, unless their books are bestsellers. Um, <laughs> You know, how can I keep my like life overhead low so that I can kind of like have time to do these projects that are really important to me? Um, and I also think like on a very practical level, I think that the upfront cost is that those starting those habits. So remembering to join a CSA and that like maybe on the weekend or on a Wednesday night when you have extra time to roast a bunch of vegetables and then you'll have all that stuff in your fridge so that you can make super quick meals. Like I eat a lot of eggs, lo you know, local eggs that I get at the farmer's market simply because they're so... It's so easy to combine stuff really quickly when I'm like, shoot, I forgot to make lunch. Um, so I think finding those shortcuts, it takes more time up front. And then to me, I don't feel like it takes more time than walking somewhere for a sandwich, waiting in line, walking back. If you just do that in the morning, then it's kind of the same time, I guess. That's how I view it. Yeah. How is that? So to follow up, how is it going to just start your book tour when you're traveling? <laughs> That's a very good question. It's tricky. Um, Boulder is wonderful. Um, we had a delicious lunch out today, and luckily have friends here who have cooked me delicious food. Um, but it's definitely hard, and it requires more planning ahead. So, for example, we drove here from um, Santa Fe, <laughs> um, and like I, was, we were at Whole Foods, and I was like, oh, I want to get a sandwich here because I know we're going to be on the road, and I don't know what's going to come on the road, what kind of food. And so it's sort of just like I'm, I'm in that, like, my mind is practiced of, like, let's think eight hours ahead when I'm hungry. Let's prepare for that time. So um, it's definitely harder, though. And that's when it's really nice to have some leeway. I travel. I went to a couple conferences during my year in process, and it was really hard. And I spent a lot of time seeking out things. And so... You know, I think a kind of a good compromise is when you're at home, do that and then do your best when you're out in the world. But it's wonderful that in places like Boulder and all over the country, restaurants, I think, increasingly are serving that kind of food. You know, Starbucks even now has little fruit and cheese platters. And I think that the more that we buy those, the more that those will appear. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I ask a lot of questions, and I do a lot of, can I not have this? Or, um, I mean, now I do less of that simply because I don't. I eat out maybe once a week, and so I tend to just be like, well, this is a treat. I'm gonna enjoy it. But yeah, when I'm trying to eat and process, I eat. I ask an inordinate amount of questions. I typically look at the menu before I go to sort of, because when you're there with a friend, you don't want to be like. You know, you kind of want to just be there in the experience. And so I, I do a lot of homework before, and I know the restaurants that are kind of friendly to the cause that are, that typically don't add a lot of additives in their salad dressing or whatever. And those typically aren't chains because, you know, a Chili's hamburger has to taste the same in Bozeman as it does in Tucson. And so they do that by adding stabilizers and preservatives, whereas some local restaurant, wherever it is, their hamburger, they're not going to add preservatives because they're just making it for their community. Mm-hmm. I do a little bit, yeah. Um, not in any great depth, um, partly because um, there are no labeling laws. So it's impossible to know if you're eating GMOs, it's, or it's very difficult to know. And so I, there was no way I could have avoided, consciously avoided GMOs because they're not labeled. That said, um, most of the GMO corn that's grown in this country goes into processed food. I think it's like 90%. And so, I'm sorry, that's, let's reverse that. 90% or um, processed foods can contain 90% GMO. So the, like the way to get rid of that is to stop eating processed food. And so it's a really kind of convenient way to avoid it, I guess. Did you have a question? Yeah, my question was about, I, I'm noticing a few different moments in your talk where you said <clears throat> kind of a social situation is what confronts somebody on the path that you're on. And I noticed that a little bit, not being a, uh, you know, on the same path, but just from being vegetarian. 
Yeah. You want to have things just be natural and not be asking too many questions at the restaurant, this kind of thing. In your book, do you address a lot of those things and give suggestions for the, the life hack of doing this and making it work? Yeah. I mean, I talk about that on a very personal level. I don't know that I give necessarily like um, recommendations. Um, during my year, I was single, and so I tried to start dating which is not when you want to be talking about your crazy food project <laughs> on a first date. And so I had to navigate that of like, how do you bring this up? How do you talk about this? And I talk about that, you know, I have, that's all in the book. Um, but I also think like, um, I think that the more people talk about it, the more it becomes socially normal to have a different diet. You know, vegetarianism, for example, today is so much more accepted than it was 30 years ago, speaking of, from someone who was raised by two vegetarians. So, um, I think it's tricky and I think kind of just explaining things and there will always be people who don't get it and that's tricky but um, I don't know, I also sort of compare it to like um, the way I sometimes think about it is like smoking for example, 60 years ago was considered sort of weird to not smoke maybe in particular settings but to, you know, I think that processed food sometimes has the exact same detrimental effects on our health so like why should we feel weird? or vegetarianism or whatever the thing is, why should we feel weird refusing it? So I think kind of like, it's, I don't know, I don't have the perfect solution. I just think kind of keep hacking away at it. <laughs> I think you're right. You're absolutely right. I mean, look at now that the Nabisco and people are taking uh, flavorings and some, some small additives out and, uh, you know, high fructose corn syrup is a huge issue now and it's gonna be eliminated from a lot of products. Yeah. And uh, it's just a matter of making your standard and, and just going through it as if it's a natural part of life. And, you know, you're the weird one, not me. It's yeah, and the reason those changes are happening in our food system is because consumers and eaters are saying, no yeah. thanks. Yeah, so there's nothing wrong with being aware yeah. and making a choice that's a healthy, good, positive one. Yeah, and it doesn't help hurt to have a sense of humor about it because uh, we just can't take ourselves that seriously. That's <laughs> my attitude, yeah. you know. All right, I'm going to have to cut this off. Um, if you have any more questions, I'd ask you to grab a book, get it signed, and come up here and talk to our author. And thank you all again so much for coming out tonight. Let's give our thank author you. a hand. Thank you.